Hello and thank you for watching Mid-American Gardener. We're here to talk about all things in the garden, trees, we'll find out what the questions are, but we are here to talk about plants. So thank you for joining us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois, so I'll answer cut flower and perennial questions, but we have a lot of talent right here next to me. Let's find out who's here and what their expertise is. And Chuck, I'm looking at you. Chuck Voigt, you're first. Well, hello, Diane. It's good to be here. Glad to have you. I am retired from the Crop Sciences Department not so recently anymore. Uh, I was a vegetable and herb specialist, so questions along those lines would be the things that I can probably do the best with, although I'll try anything. Uh, I have a, a question f that was sent in on, about garlic cloves. Perfect. Which, yeah, it's, it's my, this person saw a video on the internet about using vodka to soak garlic cloves in before you plant them. Is this necessary? and what's the best way to plant garlic cloves this time of the year. Well, first of all, since, since uh, vodka is a fairly concentrated alcohol solution, I wonder if they aren't trying to disinfect them with it. That's really the only, only positive reason I can think of for soaking them in vodka. Um, usually, garlic itself is very antimicrobial. Um, Russians in Second World War ca carried garlic because the Russia, Russia couldn't, couldn't afford to uh, give them penicillin because it was so mm. new. Um, so at any rate, planting garlic cloves, uh, we're, we're kind of getting through the ideal planting time into the iffier planting time, but you probably could still do that uh, depending on where you are in the Midwest. Um, take off the papery wrapping that holds the bulb together. Leave the paper on the, on the individual cloves, or I, that's the way I do it. Um, plant them three or four inches deep. Uh, make sure they're watered in well, which the way this season has gone isn't a problem, but in some, some falls it can be fairly dry because uh, you want them to get rooted in really strongly, uh, especially when you plant them this late. Um, and uh, once the ground starts to freeze, you know, depending on if, if you're in a fairly cold climate and you're, and you're a little paranoid about whether they're going to come through, you might want to put a mulch in them. But don't do that until after the ground starts to freeze because you want, you want to keep it frozen. You don't want it to freeze and thaw. So if you put it on beforehand, it kind of might give voles and things somewhere to go and mm -hmm. play. But uh, okay. I, I, I've never soaked garlic cloves in vodka. That would make, that would make a really strange drink once you were done. <laughs> yes, it would, and maybe more expense than you really need to plant garlic. So mine are up and looking good. So I finally did it right. I always do it. think about it too early or think about it too late. So yeah, I did yeah, it in the sweet spot. Generally, you want to get them in maybe six weeks before the ground is going to mm -hmm. freeze, which around here usually is the first couple of weeks of October. So it's, it's been a warm fall, so maybe people could slip them in. As I said before, I, I've gotten away with it as late as early December, but I don't recommend that you try to do that. Okay. All right. <coughs> well, thank you, Chuck. And let's go next to Dr. Jennifer Nelson in the middle. Hi, I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist. You can uh, read my articles online now at groundedandgrowing.co. And I've got a question from a viewer about her knockout roses. Uh, she's written to us and sent a picture about what's happening to her knockout rose bushes. And the picture looks like she's got some skeletonized leaves. And if you look down in the lower sort of left-hand side, looks to be some sort of a creature. And it's most likely the what we call a rose slug. And it is the sawfly larva. There are several different kinds, but um, they all are going to do this skeletonizing to the rose leaf. Um, the adult resembles a wasp. Uh, they're actually fairly easy to control, so they say. I've never actually see, seen them on my own roses. Uh, you can hand pick them or blast them off with some water. Uh, they can't crawl back up onto the plant, so that is, seems like an easy fix. Uh, BT does not work on them because they're not true caterpillars. So they're not going to have, BT only works on caterpillars. You can also use insecticidal soap or horticultural oil, or if you want to go the chemical route, things like carbaryl or permethrin or metacloprid would all be choices. But it sounds so easy and so organic to do it the first two methods. Blast them off. The problem or is pick you don't them notice it until they're all eaten up. That's, oh. that's yeah, yeah, that I get is it all the problem. time. So 
you don't you don't just see them if they're just crawling around you don't see them against the leaf and then you come back the next day and go oh, oh. i have a problem oh yeah so that I, does, I have never seen those yeah. before i've not had them well we've got 2200 roses sitting out at you all might you're bound to get a few so <laughs> yeah we get a little bit of visitors you have some on one or two <laughs> yeah, of them absolutely. okay well good thank you for that and now let's go to shane culture next Hi, I'm Shane Coulter. I'm one of the family owners of Country Arbor's Nursery in Urbana in Onarga, Illinois. And for 20 years, I've sat here and answered all kinds of questions about <laughs> pretty much anything green. I get those questions. So uh, that'd be my area of expertise. If it grows in <laughs> Illinois, I pretty much get to handle it. So um, I, I have a good question today. Uh, it says my neighbor gave me this plant and she does not know what it is. And I always love when people take plants, they have no clue what it is and just throw <laughs> it in their garden. Uh, and you have a plant called Persicaria. And Persicaria, the reason they gave it to you is because Ooh. it grows viciously yeah. and it grows very fast. And you will have lots of Persicaria to give to somebody else who hopefully won't know what it is when you give it to them. Don't do it. Uh, there's one called Painter's <laughs> Palette that's actually a, a quite a pretty uh, pretty plant, but it's the same issue that it's gonna grow quickly. It's a great ground cover. It's If you have an area that you can contain it and you need something that will grow anywhere, it's a fantastic plant. But just be aware, you don't if you don't if you have other things that you don't want that in, don't put that plant in there. You're gonna have to contain it a little more. But it's pretty. We have it. It's at the home where I grew up, and it was planted by my great grandmother. And I was cutting it back this past weekend. Yeah, it's very it's pronounced that that pattern in the leaf. So when I saw when we got the email saying the question. Uh, you could, I knew instantly. So it, and once you have it, you won't forget this it. This plant's lived 120 years or so. Yeah, 120 years. But year it's, old. it's you know, segregated into a lilac bush that's mowed around. But and it's, if it's really tough soil, it does tend to stay in place. But if it's nice and tilled, mm -hmm. it'll just move along. Be careful. Yeah. Very careful. Okay. Well, I just happened to have a picture sent to me. And I believe it is the youngest viewer of Mid-American Gardener, and this is Harrison, just before he turned one year old. So our youngest viewer is one year old. I want you to notice his reading choices, the five little pumpkins, and look at his laser focus on learning about horticulture. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Harrison, for that great shot of you being a, a good viewer. Laser focus, okay. Well, with that, let's go to our Did You Know segment, yes, yet. The world's oldest living rosebush is thought to be 1,000 years old. Today, it continues to bloom on the wall of the Hildesheim Cathedral in Germany. Now that is longevity, a little bit longer than the Persicaria. All right, well, let's go to the phone lines and we're gonna talk to Chad first on line two, and it's about a red bud. Hi, Chad. Doing great, how are you? And your question. Yes, I was wondering to know, we got a red bud tree that we uh, put behind a holly bush in mm -hmm. front of the house, and it's growing towards the uh, roof of our house. If we move it behind a glass window, uh, would it be better to have it behind a glass window to keep it alive? What do you mean behind a glass window? Well, behind a glass window, behind a bedroom window. Yeah, I mean, as far as moving, how big is a tree? That's a good question. It's, it's about a, probably five foot five. Oh. Okay, so it's not too big. Yeah. Um, as far as livability, uh, you know, obviously it just needs shade, a little break from the sun, but fall is, a not, is not a good time at all to move a red bud. It's probably as bad a time as you could move a red bud. Uh, it'd be something that you want to move in the spring if you do move it. And then I'm not sure how the glass window comes into play other than keep in mind the size that it's going to be, which is 20, 25, even 30 feet tall eventually. So if you're moving it because it's too close, then keep that in mind when you move it again. So you don't you have to do it twice. You can definitely prune it away from yeah. the it, And it grows roofline. in such a nice ornamental shape that no matter how you prune it, um, you can make it into a piece of art. I mean, red buds mm -hmm. are just so, you know, such great sculptures. It's a hobby to prune red, but I yeah. prune on them. There's no central leader that has to look like, yeah. <laughs> Some of the best looking ones are the gnarliest ones that they've just let yeah. go natural. Oh, there's one here on the campus of the university that it, the trunk comes down to the yeah. ground and then goes yeah. up. It's really, I always gave that one as a quiz plant. Okay, so you might try pruning, but also moving then that tree in the spring. Yeah. 
Okay, let's go to Liz's question on line three, and uh, it's about white pine. Hi, Liz. Hi. Uh, I have white, a large white pine tree and lots of needles, and I wondered, is there time for the compost? So if needles, white pine needles, in the compost. They're not going to break down particularly fast. No. And, I just like them gonna underneath need, the yeah. tree. Yeah. You need some nitrogen to... Right. to uh, Help, they they officially acidify the soil. Mm -hmm. I think people overplay that a little bit, thinking mm -hmm. that it's going to yes. change it completely. But it, it, it is a little more acidic than zero. Right. But, um, <laughs> I, I tend to mulch my blueberries with it, just kind yeah. of on sure. spec. That if it lowers it at all, it's better yeah, than, exactly. than they were they had otherwise. But like you said, Jennifer, it may take a while for it to yeah, even break down. It doesn't compost very right. well. Don't uh -huh. be That's why people use it in the south, mm -hmm. is because it does it make does a good bedding and it stays down quite a long time. So it would aerate because it wouldn't break down, but yeah. you'll end up with, you know, those long, slender But I wouldn't pieces. build a compost pile out of no. it. It's, uh, even leaves aren't going to cook it down enough. Yeah. I'd just decorate with it. Yeah, or so bail it up and give it to somebody else that <laughs> wants it. It's great for top dressing on <laughs> yeah. mulch. So. Yeah. But anyway, so we're thinking it might take you a little too long to get that to compost. And I can guarantee you that after you've mulched, then they will fall. They don't fall <laughs> yes. before you mulch. That's just how it works. That is. After you but put a it's nice, beautiful, fresh, though. It is, unless you wanted a nice layer of mulch. Well, there and is then that. And they, then they coat it. So. so put half the mulch, let the needles fall, yeah. and then do Trigger the other. Trigger it and then finish it off. Yeah. Because you, have, you don't want to go to the gym. You just want to put mulch on all the time. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go to Pat's question on line four about hydrangea. Hi there, Pat. Pat. Hi. Uh, I didn't trim my uh, hydrangea back last year, and this summer it was just gorgeous and just full bloom. But it's grown to be over five foot tall, uh, and it still has all those blooms, you know, dried up on it. Now, can I trim those off, and, uh, and will it bloom next year? What kind of hydrangea is it? Oak leaf hydrangea. Oh, okay. Okay, that helps. Yeah, that's okay. it's perfectly acceptable to just take the flowers off. If you don't have mm -hmm. to take any more of the wood off, then then don't. Um, and if you if you have to take as little off as you can, because you've got a it sounds like a really nicely mm -hmm. growing uh, oak leaf, and you might as well enjoy it. But it does bloom on the old wood, so uh, you want to keep as much as you can. And it's going to get quite a bit taller. Five foot is for an oak leaf is is not that big over time. But you what can take them back. What will the um, the height be? Well, you know, if you let seven or eight feet is not okay. unheard of. Mm -hmm. And I've there's actually some uh, oak leaf in uh, old Urbana that the trunks are eight, ten inches, oh, wow. and they're mm -hmm. probably fifty years old. But they do they are trimmed back pretty heavily and let that new growth. They tr mm -hmm. they flush out very well from a trimming. And you can still get them to bloom, but we do it as soon as we see the very first sign of leaves, we trim it, and that's mm -hmm. soon enough that'll allow new flush of growth and make it nice and full and still get bloomed. Mm -hmm. Those first leaves, that flush, they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. They're huge. It's really and, a pretty yeah. plant. Getting things <coughs> early is important. Trying to get things after they leaf out. You know, we shape them now, we take off the leaves, get it looking nice, but we don't do any of the pruning till that very first sign of life, and then we cut it back and get it mm -hmm. early. And that flushes our plants out really well. That's the secret to making it in a container look good mm -hmm. is to cut it back and then it gets all this beautiful new growth on it. So deadhead those older blooms and yeah. if you like the way it looks, put them in baskets or, I mean, we, we use them decoratively as yeah, well. I leave mine on, but you know, to I each do too. his own. But if you want to take them off, you can use them yeah. decoratively. Okay, well, we're, going, we're waiting for some more phone calls. So while we're doing that, let's go <coughs> back to the emails, another round. Okay. I have uh, one from uh, Ken. Uh, I have a Carolina Reaper pepper plant that I've been growing in a two gallon pot for three years. I keep it outside during the summer and bring it inside around this time of the year. I would like to transplant it into a five gallon pot. Should I do this now or wait until spring? Thank you. Um, well, it depends a little bit on, on where you have it when you bring it inside. If you have it in a sort of a marginal location where you're just trying to get it to overwinter, then I would say don't transplant it until spring because it's, it's, it's going to be struggling to just to stay alive and uh, it, that wouldn't be so good. If, if 
you had a greenhouse, say, and you're bringing it into a greenhouse over the winter, then it would be fine because it's going to be warm and, and able to grow and, and, and come back nicely. Um, but for my money, I'd say, just on a guess, I'd say you're not having it in a really wonderful place through the winter, and I would wait until spring, uh, go in, um, prune the roots a little bit because if, if it's been in a pot that long, they're going to be circling pretty badly. Uh, just go down two or three sides and cut them and then move them into the bigger pot and uh, at, at the time when you're about to put it outside and it should just uh, go into the, the new soil that's in there and, and take right off and, and uh, be ready to go. Um, five gallons of, of soil is, is fairly heavy so be, be ready for that but other than that should work out fine if, you, if you've kept it through a couple of winters already. Uh, just be careful with those things because they're really hot. Yeah, I've got the chocolate yellow and Carolina. I overwinter them as well. Yeah. Just a matter of being able to keep water to them. If it's so dry and so rooted, then you're going to need to upgrade it regardless because it's hard to keep water. But yeah, they're 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 quite a spicy pepper. Okay. I think. Yeah. Beware. Dangerous, yeah. Miller. Dangerous. <laughs> All right. Spicy in place. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm <coughs> going to transition then to your question, Jennifer. Okay. We're going away from peppers, and uh, this viewer sent us a question of what is this? Uh, the attached photo is a plant that grew in their yard last year, and they said it looked like it might be something. Don't we all get that sort of thing? Like you're just sure it's not a weed. It stayed green almost all winter long, and as you can mm -hmm. see, it bloomed this year. What is it? And I can tell you, my, my first thought was phlox, but then uh, Chuck and Diane pointed out that phlox would have a taller flower cluster, so it's probably sweet william. And Diane said also you can notice there's some, some flowers in there that have two colors on them, and that's very characteristic of sweet william, which is Dianthus barbados. And the staying green over the winter is also... Um, something that this perennial does routinely. So, hey, you lucked out, you have a nice perennial in your yard. So, And it's generally a biannual. And it's actually bian more biennial. Yeah. I suppose some so, warmer winters. Sometimes they, they can <coughs> kind of creep along. Yeah, they do. Um, and you can see it seeded itself really nicely because the whole patch was... There you right, and, and a nice yeah. color selection within yeah, the so patch. Yeah, you can tell it just sets a perfect location. And I location. help it seed other places. Exactly. Would it be one once you get it established to have the, the green one year? You would have both the You have them both and at the, the same time. The seeds same amongst time. itself. I've had them maybe 10, 15 years. Okay. I move them around. And there's a couple new perennials from that. One's called yeah. like Heartbreak or something uh -huh. along. It's a red one that comes back every year. So it's a true perennial. Yeah, okay. It just doesn't have that mix of color. I do like that mix of it's, color. That's beautiful. I thought that yeah. was really pretty. Yeah. Okay. And a wonderful fragrance. Yes. And I sold it as a cut flower when I was in Switzerland. Hmm. Yeah. They, it was a very big cut flower mm -hmm. there. That's where you can see why. It's beautiful. It's picture. beautiful. Okay. Now, Shane, what have you got for us? I see All you're right. looking well, for something Don't make fun here. of my, my plants too much like Chuck was earlier. But, <laughs> but people <laughs> always ask the most common question we sell thousands of moms, and they want to know... What is a perennial mum? Am I buying a perennial mum? And a true perennial mum is a different plant, most likely, than you're buying in the garden centers. Uh, they will come back, but that's a whole other way of doing it. These are true perennial mums. These absolutely will come back, and you really have to work hard to get them to not come back <laughs> over the winter. Uh, they're quite a bit larger. They're going to be three foot by three foot, and they really respond well to a hard June cut back. So if we have them in the ground, we will go and literally cut them to the ground in June and let them start over so they're a little fuller, a little tighter. Um, and they come in a range of colors now. They used to be kind of pinky and white and softer pastels, but there's these new mammoth series and other series that are coming out that are starting to get into the reds and the dark pinks that really give you a variety. There's some called mat, excuse me, matchsticks types where the ends are uh, a little fluted. So there's a really good color mm. selection. Uh, and they will come back. You just have to, they're, they're going to be a little wilder looking. You can see they'll get a little dead on them, a little lanky on them, but a little trimming will do a great job. And you can always dig up a little group and give it to your friends. And they'll bloom all the way into Christmas. There's been many years in Christmas these are still blooming. And they bloom a little later, October, rather than, you're not going to see any blooming in August and September usually. But that's a good thing. It's, a, it's beautiful. I want them later. And it will take over a huge, you know, three foot's a big flower and just it one is. plant will do that. And again, they, they root pretty readily and everybody likes a plant that, that 
you can't kill, and this might <laughs> join that category. How, how late in the fall can you plant them and have them, have them be hardy? I've, I have yet to find a time that I can't plant these and have them come back. Yeah, I have, I've never killed one. Because most of the garden mums, if you buy them exactly. when you're getting toward holiday season and then try to plant them, oh, yeah. that doesn't work. You should have planted these, them in March. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or <laughs> March to August. Even if you get, if you'd have a better chance if you got mm -hmm. them in September or yeah, right. and, mm -hmm. and that's something at our garden center, we're <coughs> taking our fall mums and starting to sell them in spring. Mm -hmm. And that way they right. have a really good chance of them coming back. Yeah, I've, I've seen Excellent. places where they, they actually force them to have a flower on it because that helps to sell right. them. Absolutely. But, They'll but bloom in <coughs> June. Uh, that's the thing people mm -hmm. don't realize. Garden mums really are kind of cut back so that they will bloom later mm -hmm. in the fall. That's not their natural blooming yeah, time. It's, 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 it's good to see what color you're getting and yeah. flower right. flowers. Flowers sell. We have learned <laughs> that in the garden that industry. That right. is yeah. right. <coughs> not always necessary, but that no. is right. Yeah. Okay, well let's go to Lois's question. She's on <coughs> line two and it's about a hydrangea again. Let's go to a hydrangea question. Lois, what is that question? Uh, hi, Diane. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. I have I have a hydrangea that's probably five or six years old. The first years it bloomed blue. This year it bloomed pink. And through the summer, the pink blooms changed to an ugly green. What do I need to do? Okay. Yeah, you want that one? That's we want you, Shane, yeah. to answer. Unless well, Chuck wants to answer. Well, it, it sounds like you need, <clears throat> you need to acidify the soil mm -hmm. uh, because it, it sounds like when they were planted, there was probably some amendment made, and so they were nice and blue, which happens in acid soil. Uh, the native soil through most of the middle part of the country is not <laughs> particularly acid, uh, so periodically you need to you need to add some some acidifying material to the soil to uh, and then mulch it with pine white and, pine needles. Yeah, 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 contact that lady exactly. with the pine needles <laughs> and yeah, put put down uh, something. Uh, so one of the yeah, sulfates. Of the aluminum, sulfates. Yeah, yeah, aluminum sulfate, sulfate uh, ammonium or aluminum sulfate, mm -hmm. just water it yeah. in with that. And, and you can watch the colors change. You can change it to blue, and you can get it almost to this beautiful purple color if you uh, put the right amount on. But that's why. We know you're going to buy more blue in the garden center, mm -hmm. so we put plenty of amendments on there to get it blue because it's a more popular color. And you know green is a very popular hydrangea color for cut mm -hmm. flower. Yeah. So don't discount that green. Yeah, I guess it, <laughs> it's, it's really highly prized. For yeah, cut and there's flowers. some that are there's some newer ones that are just green. But there exactly. th there is new hydrangea that came out this year, and I believe it's Bloomstruck that automatically changes color on its own and has pink and blue together that you don't need to put in the aluminum Ooh, sulfate. Ah. So life is getting easier in the plant world. Yeah, we love that. Okay, thank you for your question. And now we're going to go to a a plant question about dwarf iris, and this is Connie's question on line three. Hi, Connie. Hi, um, I've had this uh, plant, I am assuming is a dwarf Dutch iris. It's been here since I moved here, and the bed that it is about four foot by six foot full of these. Um, in the fall, I never know what to do with them. I don't know whether to cut them back like I do my bearded iris, it, they, you know, it gets so matted down, and those are, leaves are so fine that I'm afraid if I cut it a lot, you know, I'll kill it out. I'm just not really sure what to do with that much other than transplanting half of it in the next year or so. Now, is this iris a little fuller flower, or is it really strappy, thin? It's a fairly fine uh, flower. And really fine foliage, almost... Uh, yeah, fairly fine foliage Probably as a well. Siberian, like a mm -hmm. Caesar's brother type, okay. yeah. Siberica. Okay. Yeah, and, and those mm -hmm. don't get any of the um, the bore problems, mm -hmm. so it's really up to you. It, but it is kind of hard to define them. You know, one time I had a vol divide mine, and it was easier. <laughs> but but you can cut them back, or you can transplant them. It's probably a little better to do it earlier in the year. But iris are tough, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. they'll just take a break for one year or flower later. Yeah. It's hard to get motivated in midsummer. Yes, it right is. after they bloom, but that would be a pretty good time to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably the best, but it's also <laughs> the hottest and most uncomfortable. Yeah, this is probably so. the least good time to do it. You probably, it is. You right. can almost do it any time. Now is probably pushing it a little late in the season, mm -hmm. but, but they're hard to kill again as well. And, yeah. si and the, si the Siberica, if that's what it is, um, yeah, when it gets too full, it may stop blooming as well. Not as, mm -hmm. not as bad as some of the other uh, types, but, but yeah. You can you can definitely clean it up and cutting it back now is fine. 
it's done its work. Those leaves need to provide it for energy for next year, and that energy is in the bulb. So. You know, I like to do experiments, and so she could move one little section yeah. of it just from the side and put it somewhere else and see yeah. how it does. And Who knows anymore with this weather? We could be, <laughs> we could be still uh, on the beach. <laughs> Two here. more weeks yeah. of 80 degrees, you never That's know. That's exactly right. Get but out anyway. and work in the garden. But definitely you can cut it back, and all of, all of us should be out cutting back our iris and removing those leaves off-site, yes. getting them out of the garden. Do yes. not compost them. Get them away. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching. It goes fast when you're answering all kinds of fun questions, and we appreciate all of you viewers because you really are a sharp group of folks, so thank you very much. Well, I want to thank each of you. I want to thank all of you as well. We hope that you get out. There's still a lot of things to do this fall. Have fun at it while you're doing it, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.